Hey everyone, welcome to the Desuckify Work Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Mike Wolfson, co-founder and chief creative officer at High Wide and Handsome, an ad agency in LA. He and his partner started the agency in 2010 with one goal, to be the best place to work in the advertising industry. 13 years later, they sit in the number one spot on ad age's best places to work list. Not too shabby. You may have noticed their goal says nothing about awards or revenue or client size or any of the typical stuff that agencies seem to go gaga over. Why is that? Well, that's what we touch on during our conversation. We talk about the critical importance of trust in any work culture. We talk about their decision to remain a work from anywhere agency, even as others push hard to get butts back in seats. And we talk about how all of this attention to the employee experience has led to an unheard of 95% retention rate in an industry where most agencies turn over their full staff in about three years. I, for one, am just shocked that treating your employees well leads to happier and more loyal employees. Who could have seen that coming? Okay, let's get to it and welcome our guest, Mike Wolfson. Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Desuckify Work Podcast. Today, our guest is Mike Wolfson. Mike, welcome. Thanks, TJ. Yeah, great to have you here. Nice to be with you. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to get uh, a quick overview of who Mike Wolfson is. You know, what's your story? How did you, how did you come to be doing what you're doing today? How did you get here? Uh, well, it's a 28 year journey. Actually, <laughs> okay. hard to believe, but nice. I'm in in year 28 at this point in advertising. Mm -hmm. I honestly, didn't even know advertising was something that I wanted to do as a career. Didn't even know it was a career until my second. Uh, semester of my senior year of college, um, oh. which was a little late in the game. And it's funny because when I think back, it, it always seems like it should have been an obvious uh, path for me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I grew up, my mom had her own business that she ran out of the house. It was a party planning business. And I used to write the jingles for her uh, outgoing messages um, back when, you know, we all had answering machines in the house and you had to hear those uh messages every time the the phone rang yep and my dad was a basketball coach and you know i used to design the the t-shirts and the jerseys and and things like that for, for mm. his practices so it was always something that seemed like an obvious career path i just didn't know until i went to a uh, seminar on internships, uh, my second uh, semester of, of my senior year of college. And I heard somebody talk about doing an internship at an ad agency as a copywriter. Mm -hmm. And when she was describing the job, I was like, that's it. Like, that's, that's, that's what I want to do. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it was at the time when I'm sure you can remember, um, mm -hmm. I came up in this business around the same time when the portfolio schools were really coming into Mm -hmm. So it was quite a disadvantage to, to graduate from college um, without mm -hmm. a portfolio and be competing with all those people coming out of those schools with those incredible portfolios. So yeah, it took me almost a year out of college to get my first break mm -hmm. uh, in advertising. And um, I, I got a chance to work at a small business to business agency in, in Syracuse, New York. Uh, I got mm -hmm. by the name of John Herschel, gave me my first break. And 28 years later, I I'm really grateful to him. And I sent him notes on a regular basis, just reminding cool. him that, you know, everything I've accomplished in this business, I, I owe to him because honestly, prior to, to that, I had been laughed out of some of the worst ad agencies in America um, because I didn't have a portfolio. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I started out uh, at, at a small business, business to business agency in Syracuse, uh, managed to kind of work my way up the the ranks in, in the upstate New York uh, agencies. Um, there was a lot of Saatchi and Saatchi in Rochester okay. that had Kodak and, and DuPont. And so I worked there for a little while. Mm -hmm. Kind of got my first um, big break, if you want to call it that, when I went to Darcy in St. Louis. Um, oh, okay. Darcy, um, not, mm -hmm. yeah. not around anymore. But back then, um, I remember the agency that was doing the original Budweiser Frogs um, Mm. Super Bowl commercial. They were doing the Taste the Rainbow Skittles work. They were doing Twix. Uh, if you remember, two for me, none for you. <laughs> yes. um, 
so it was a great agency to to be at at, at the time and, and really kind of gave me my first big exposure to uh you know big production and, and big clients and mm. and I was working there that I uh uh was working on a campaign for Coca-Cola and uh, that's my first time coming out to LA for production. Mm-hmm. Uh, as many stories go, I ended up meeting uh, the woman who had later become my wife on that trip, uh, mm-hmm. which is what brought me out to LA. And I worked at some agencies around LA before uh, freelancing at a, a little agency in Marina Del Rey uh, that at the time was about 15 people with one client. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I spent eight and a half years there uh, helping to grow that shop to about 150 people wow. and 100 million in billings, where I was ultimately the senior vice president and executive creative director. Mm-hmm. Uh, and honestly, it was kind of after eight and a half years of, of that process, you know, to be really transparent that I reached a point at 36 years old, 14 years into my career, where I was like, I don't think I can do this anymore. Mm. I don't want to be in this business anymore. Wow. Uh, you know, again, being really transparent, um, it reached a point where I actually found a, a therapist a block away from the office. Mm. And I would walk there every Friday at two o'clock in the afternoon just to try to figure out whether or not I could come back on Monday and, and keep wow. going. Wow. Uh, so, you know, to be 36 years old and kind of burnt out in mm. the advertising industry. Um, and, and honestly, at that point, kind of thinking about what else could I do with my life? Cause I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Um, it's kind of what inspired me to talk to, uh, two of my coworkers at the time, mm-hmm. uh, guys who were running the, uh, account management department, uh, a guy named Magnus Morgan and, and another guy named John Truscott. Um, mm-hmm. so, you guys want to go start an agency and uh, you know, not with, I think the, the typical ambitions of, of most people who go and start an agency, which is, Hey, we could win a lot of awards and we could get a lot more personal recognition and we could make a lot more money. Mm -hmm. Uh, But kind of with the thought that why am I being run out of this industry? Yeah. Because I love it. Yeah. I love the work. I love the creativity. I love the intersection of business strategy and and creativity. I love the opportunity to do film and print and photography and typography and and audio and and just bring all of these these tools together. Mm -hmm. I just don't like the dynamics between agency and employee. Mm -hmm. I don't like the dynamics between agency and client. And what if we started an agency with the ambition of changing those dynamics. Wow. And so that's what kind of led us to, to start High, Wide and Handsome uh, mm-hmm. 14 years ago. Uh, you know, we did start it with the ambition of creating the best place to work in the industry. Oh. I, don't, I don't think a lot of people like start an ad agency, <laughs> like, you know, what's your goal? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't to be <clears throat> acquired by Omnicom or Publicis. <laughs> it wasn't to you know, win a, a gold lion or um, anything like that, you know, it was truly like, we want to create the best place to work mm. industry. And and so yeah. that's what we've been trying to do for the last 14 years. Wow. It's a really cool story. I mean, I think, you know, what, what jumps out at me is you, you have this moment of, you know, doubt, right? Is this where I should be? And it sounds like that doubt was, was really fueled more from the experience you as an employee in this business sure. just going this this can't be it this can't be it and maybe at first thinking well i guess i gotta leave yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then thankfully i don't know whether it was the help of that therapist or just you kind of mulling it over you got to some place where you go well maybe i can do something about it and and luckily you had a couple of, of co-workers who you felt would be game for it and um I, I think I agree. I, I don't think you hear that too often that people are creating agencies to be the best place to work. It's usually to do the best work. Maybe you might hear that. Um, so I, I think that's a really interesting and very different perspective. And and how has it gone over these 14 years for you? I mean, I've always described it as an experiment. 
honestly, we started the agency with a, a set of beliefs and a set of principles. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, one of the, the quotes, I am, I'm not a big, not a big quote guy. Um, but, but one of my favorites, uh, that, that my partner, John Truscott would often say when we started the shop was a, a quote from Bill Birnbeck, uh, which was, um, a principle isn't a principle until it costs you something. Right. Mm. And so I think that was part of the experiment was what if we kind of put these principles into action? Um, what would happen? Mm. You know, what if you actually only needed to work 40 hours a week mm-hmm. in advertising? What if late nights and, and dinner at the desk wasn't an expected part of the process? What if Saturday and Sunday weren't work days in advertising? What if mm-hmm. you said no to unreasonable requests from clients Mm. Um, and you know some of the things that we did early on where we we said uh from day one we're never going to have more than 50 people interesting easy thing for three guys making a plan (laughs) in a a spare bedroom to to talk about right Mm -hmm. um but not many agencies start with that kind of Mm -hmm fundamental principle. And, and obviously, if you say we're never going to have more than 50 people, you've already kind of put a cap on what your potential is in terms of financial ever being acquired yeah. or, um, you know, the type of clients mm-hmm. uh, win at, at, at that type of size. But for us, it was about we want to have a personal relationship with every employee mm-hmm. within our agency. And we figured if it, you can't do that with more than 50 people, um, yeah. we wanted to have a personal relationship with every client that mm. we were, you know, we had been a part of uh, the kind of traditional bait and switch pitch at agencies, right? Where you go mm-hmm. and you meet all the senior leadership and, yeah. and the client says, hey, you guys you know, seem like you know what you're doing. You seem like reasonable people we'd like to work with. And then you hire that agency and you never see those people. Ever again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think more than anything, what we, we set out to do was, change one of the most fundamentally ignored aspects of the advertising industry, uh, which is uh, employee retention Mm. or the lack thereof, to be honest. You know, it's, it's an industry where the average turnover is 36% a year. Yeah. That's insane to me. I just, I mean, it's crazy. Right. And if you think about it, like, if you're turning over 36% of your employees every year, then ostensibly you're a different agency every three years. Yeah. Yeah. And then agencies get frustrated that they can't retain a client mm-hmm. for more than two or three years. But how do you retain a client for more than two or three years if the client's looking around and saying, this is a completely different agency than the one that I hired and I have to keep retraining mm-hmm. the same agency year over year. Yeah. And so, that was the biggest thing we set out to do was to, to kind of change that dynamic and say, why should the average relationship between an agency and an employee be one to two years? Mm -hmm. Why can't it be 10 years? Mm -hmm. And why can't both sides kind of come into the relationship with that expectation? And so I think one of the things we've tried to do, and, and certainly it's a big part of the interview process for me is establish that, dynamic in that relationship Mm -hmm. at the beginning so it's part of the interview process for me and i will actually oftentimes in the course of a an initial interview with with a prospective employee at high wide and handsome say i want to talk about what is typically unspoken in these conversations which is you're thinking i'll come join your agency for a year or two Mm -hmm. some experience and work in my portfolio, uh, parlay that into maybe a promotion and more money at Mm -hmm. another agency. And the person on my side of the table is usually thinking, that's fine because we're going to bring you out so badly over the course of the next one or two years that there'll be nothing left Mm -hmm. in time to discard you and replace you with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of unspoken, but very understood yeah. Dynamic for as long as I've been in the mm-hmm. industry. So I start by saying, my hope and expectation is that if you join our agency, you're going to be with us for 10 years, hmm. hopefully more. Wow. And I understand that that's 
my responsibility. Like in order for you to stay for 10 years, you need to have more opportunity. Mm -hmm. You need to have more compensation. Mm -hmm. You have to do the things that make it possible. Yeah. Uh, I think again, in most industries, not just advertising, um, it is really difficult to get the recognition and the rewards that you deserve without jumping somewhere. Yeah. Right. And Mm -hmm. I've just never understood why agencies that rely so heavily on talent don't put more focus on the retention of that talent. It's an interesting thing because what what I think it, it is, and this is just this is a bit of a blanket statement, right? Because I know there are plenty of agencies who don't operate this way, but I think you know talent is, is viewed as a line item, right? Often, you know, the same the same way you know computer equipment might be viewed as a line item. You know, it's you know people who might bemoan the state of the the industry these days. We'll talk about the sort of financialization, the the accountants took over, um, that kind of stuff. And I think to some degree, there's truth in that because you can see it in the way talent is is handled. You know, it it is treated as like, like you said, like squeeze them dry, push them out. There's always somebody else waiting to come in, right? And what I what I always wonder behind that, if if the accountants really did take over, you know. Does that even does that cost structure work? Because you talk about a 36% turnover rate every year. It costs a lot of money to hire somebody. And it costs and Yeah, it costs a lot of money to train or to suffer through the period of time where they don't know what they're doing, you know, and to suffer through the client, you know, pushback, like you said, right? I've got this whole team here who doesn't know my business at all. I guess I have to wait six months before they finally know, and then in a year they're gonna be gone. I, it feels like nobody's accounting for that properly either. So even if you were this cold hearted, like purely by the numbers, it's the only way I want to run this business. It seems like more people should end up at least closer to where you are for sure. just by that. And yet they don't. So I don't have the answer to that, but it's, it's just an observation and, and, a, and a thing that confuses me at times. Um, but I'm grateful, obviously, that there are places like yours that are, that are trying to do this, um, and for reasons obviously beyond the bottom line reasons and more sort of trying to create a, a human centered experience an employee first culture. Right. Um, and I, yeah, I would, I would say not, not to cut you off, but I would say um, it is important to me that people understand that we're a very profitable agency. Right. I get that. Because yeah. I think that is the pushback oftentimes, right. It's like, Oh, mm-hmm. that's nice. How does that work? But, but you got to, you got to make a profit. Like, it's mm-hmm. a yeah. And, and I agree with you a hundred percent that if you were able to quantify it, and I think you probably can, mm-hmm. uh, you would find out that it is actually more uh, profitable mm-hmm. to put that emphasis on, on the retention. And I would say that that is, is yes, absolutely. Lower recruitment costs, lower training costs, all of those types of things but client retention. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The cost of new business. Right. Agencies spend so much money chasing mm. new business. Yeah. And if you would just retain the clients that you had, mm-hmm. you continue to build on it, but you don't get into this vicious cycle of mm-hmm. we lost this account. Now we got to win another one. We lost that account. We got to win another one. Mm-hmm. And that can cost so much money and you lose so many of those. Right. And so, just in the client retention, you know, we have clients that we've been working with since we started the agency 14 years ago. Like, like we have one client we've worked with for 14 years, one client we've worked with for 10 years, one for nine years. Mm -hmm. Um, We even have a client that we've had for four years now who actually came to us and said, we really liked the agency we were working with. Unfortunately, there was a creative team there that really understood our business and they left. Uh And they brought in other people and they just don't get our business the way that the other mm-hmm. teams. Did. So it was a direct one-to-one mm-hmm. failure to retain that team of creatives translated into failure to retain that client. Wow. And so it, it absolutely is. Yes. It's a moral inspiration 
Mm -hmm. But it's good business. Like it, yeah. it just is. Which is kind of like, it's sort of the dream, I feel like, for, particularly, I think, in in the advertising business, and this might be true in others, I obviously don't have the same exposure, but I think you'll find people who who wish and hope for this this better thing, right? And and you kind of can get beaten down by the, the the tough stuff that you deal with. But a lot of people, even underneath all the, the surface level skepticism and cynicism, are idealists at heart and, and really want to do, quote unquote, the right thing. But they also obviously understand that it needs to work. And I think so the fact that you guys are are doing something that feels right but that also gives you guys a, a good profit and is a sustainable business model i think of that as as just a good model for others to at least look to and go you know if you're interested and you're inspired by the sort of moral imperative to do something differently and do something that, a way that, that that sits right with your values it's not a pipe dream it is it is possible and, and talk to Mike and, and you can get a, a perspective on, on one way of doing it at least. Right. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's why I say it is a bit of an experiment. Yeah. It is our willingness to go out there and say, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be the guinea pigs, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I, if you don't believe that these principles can actually work, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll try to prove that, that they can. And I do think, you know, I, I don't want to, um, gloss over how easy it is to kind of start by saying we want to be the best place to work in the industry like, okay yeah what is that though right and yeah. we want to retain people for 10 years mm -hmm. okay but how how are you going to do that mm -hmm. right i think one of the things i've i've written about in the past is if Agen I mean, agencies are so good at solving problems mm -hmm. for clients mm -hmm. and they very, very rarely can turn that talent inward. Mm -hmm. What if we applied the same level of creativity mm -hmm. to our own problems? Right. <laughs> First, you have to identify like, oh, okay, turnover of 36%, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. How do we address that. Yeah. And that's really what we tried to, to do is say, what are some solutions to the problems that we've seen that we can implement that maybe nobody's thought of before, mm -hmm. right? So uh, we developed a program, one of the, the programs I'm the most proud of, um, something called Peer Pay. Mm -hmm. Peer Pay is a program where every single employee in our company, and, and I mean that literally, whether you've been with us for a day or for 10 years, whether you're the most junior person in the company or the most senior, every single person in the company can give any other employee in the company a $500 spot bonus at any time for any reason without the need for approval from a manager. Oh, wow. So you don't have to come to me or to Magnus or to John and say like, hey, would it be okay if I could give mm -hmm. Lord a 500, you just tell us like, yeah. I want to give Lori a $500 spot bonus. If you mm -hmm. want to tell us why, that's great. We'd love to hear it, mm -hmm. but you don't have to justify it. Mm. And so that does so many things. Like, first of all, the level of trust mm. that that instills and reflects in the employees. Mm -hmm. Going back to what I was telling you earlier about my experience, when I was prior to starting High, Wide, and Handsome, when I was senior vice president and executive creative director at an agency with 150 people, mm -hmm. I could not give a $50 bonus to somebody on my creative team. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. I didn't have the power to do it. Mm -hmm. And I went to the CFO and asked for that bonus more times than not. I was told no. Wow. Uh, so, so there you are, someone who's on the senior leadership team of an mm -hmm. agency who can't even give a direct report, a $50 bonus. Now mm -hmm. we have every single employee can give a $500 bonus to anyone in the company for any time, uh, mm -hmm. at any time for any reason. Yeah. And what we discovered really quickly is people actually enjoy giving those. I would, I would argue more than receiving them, but mm -hmm. certainly as much as much. Yeah. There's yeah. just an incredible feeling. And we've mm -hmm. all done, we've all worked with people. Mm -hmm. 
that we've recognized like, God, that person's so great. They do so yes. much, but it's under the radar and nobody mm -hmm. sees it. And they're not mm -hmm. the loud person who's always looking for the credit. Right. right. And mm -hmm. like, I wish there was something I could do for them mm -hmm. in our company. You just say, here, I wanted to give you a $500 bonus. I saw what you've been doing. Uh, and by the way, just to kind of reinforce the meritocracy of, of that system, mm -hmm. we don't announce when somebody gets mm -hmm. one of those because you might say, oh, well, I was going to give Lori a $500 peer pay, but you did. So like, uh, you know, if you did yeah, that, yeah. then at the end of the year, you end up probably like everybody gets. It's a sort of a little bit of a, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But we've got 30 employees and everybody gets to do $2,000 a year in peer pay. Mm -hmm. So we get $60,000 in the peer pay pool. Mm -hmm. If one person at the end of the year ends up with $18,000 in peer pay, like, right. Great. Great. Yeah. Just, right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some of the other dynamics that kind of came out of that, that honestly weren't even planned. The first time somebody came to us and said, I'd like to give my manager a peer pay. Hmm. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Why not? Again, going back to, to the experiences that we've all had where it's like, God, my manager is so great. They do so much to support me. They do so much to help me. But that dynamic is like, they can do things for me. There's really just nothing I can do for them. It's like, no, mm -hmm. you can. You can, you yeah. can work with your manager. I don't know any other, forget advertising agency. I don't know any other company mm -hmm. where you, you can, can give a bonus yeah, to your manager. Reward your, your manager. Yeah. I mean, so, I, I think there's, I, I hear a lot of interesting stuff in there. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the sort of commitment and, and trust that it builds to, to, to be a part of that. Um, you know, the fact that you do it in a way that clearly signals trust from the top, I think is a big thing too, that you're not asking for justification and, and you've got this pool and it's just, like you said, day one, you show up day one and somebody does a really good job welcoming you, you could go, here's 500 bucks. Like, I, I think that that culture of trust, you know, um, you know, people talk a lot about work culture these days. And, and I think there's lots of different definitions. And I think the simplest and I would say perhaps the worst are the ones that talk about culture more around sort of goofy perks. You know, it's the, the classic foosball table. It's, you know, uh, you know, beer Thursdays, these kinds of things, which I'm not saying they're bad, but they're not yeah. culture. Um, and, and it seems like you guys work really hard to focus on a culture that comes from trust. You know, I hear it in, in, in the peer pay. And, you know, I wanna touch on one other thing that I think is a really good example of this. And, and you wrote about this pretty recently. You know, we all we all went remote three and a half years ago. Yep. Had to go remote. Suddenly we're sitting in front of our computers and that's how work happens. Um, and I think we've all noticed in the past year or so, companies, trying to figure out a way to claw back from that, right? And there's various degrees of that. Some of them just say, okay, well, we're hybrid and that means show up once in a while. Some of them go, nope, Tuesday through Thursday, you got to show up. Some are even now kind of trying to go full, bring everybody back. And, you know, what's interesting is, is a lot of what people are doing before they, they force that is some of those goofy perks like, oh, we, we added this, this, this little, this arcade section to the, to the office. Don't you want to come now? And um, you guys have, have chosen a different path. You guys are, are remaining remote or what I would actually say work from anywhere might be a better definition. What, what made you decide to, to take that approach? It was such an easy decision. I mean, it's not even anything we've ever had to spend time debating uh, because universally it's been life-changing for our employees. Mm -hmm. And again, if you start out with the idea of we're trying to create the best place to work in the industry mm -hmm. we have to kind of be responsive to the needs and, and desires of the people you hire. And mm -hmm. it's, as I said, just been, been life-changing for, for so many different people, including me. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie about, about that as well, right? Yeah. Um, you know, when my, my uh, two partners, so um, John, who I mentioned, he's now retired. 
okay. we talked earlier this year. Um, but when we were in our most current office, which we've been in since the start of this year, so it's been about nine, 10 months, mm-hmm. uh, he's going into the office most days. Like, he likes to do that. That, yes. was, that was how he liked to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had probably a 30, 35 minute commute. Okay. Um, I live a mile from the office. It's, it's about an eight minute commute for mm-hmm. me. And yeah. I would maybe get there once a month. Mm. Uh, and, and it's just personal preference of, of right. how you like to work. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, I think the idea that there's like a, a one size fits all solution mm-hmm. and that it's beneficial to force everybody to kind of work the same way mm-hmm. uh, is detrimental. And, and I had to just be honest about that from my own experience that I'm not only more productive working from home, I'm, I'm happier. And, you know, mm-hmm. the article that, that you're referencing, you know, I talked a lot about um, the opportunity to spend more time with my dogs, mm-hmm. to spend more time with my wife who yeah. works from home. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I talked in that article about uh, my dog Lincoln, who I had for 15 years. We got him from a rescue when he was two. Um, at the time that I wrote that earlier this year, he was 17 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was, you know, his health was failing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, sadly, a um, couple of weeks after that, we, we lost Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think about the number of hours that I got to, to work with, with him by my side, the number of times I got to, to take him on walks over those three mm-hmm. months if I was working from home and the idea that I would have not been able to do that mm-hmm. uh, in a traditional kind of uh, commute and, and work at the office um, style is, is it's like hard for me to even contemplate yeah. that, that by a structure of my own choosing, I would deprive myself of those opportunities. Right. Yeah. Why would we deprive so many of the people who work for us of, of similar opportunities? And, you know, I don't Mm -hmm. know, um, but so many of our employees do. Yeah. And I love it it when, you know, I, I have a meeting with somebody who's at their six year old daughter's jujitsu lesson. Mm. yeah it's it's awesome it's amazing it's like Mm -hmm. it was unfathomable four years ago right five years ago even in our you know experimental audacious beliefs of we can do things completely differently and we can rethink Mm -hmm. uh, never contemplated the idea that yeah the housing agency everybody could could work from home everybody Mm. Uh, so you know just listening to the employees and just hearing them say how much it's, it's changed their lives, the, the ability to spend more time with their significant others, with their children, with their mm-hmm. pets. Um, you know, we've had people who really sadly over the last few years have had really ailing parents, mm-hmm. um, you know, a couple of employees whose parents have passed away. Uh, they got to be there yeah. with their parents for six, seven, eight months wow. living at home. Mm-hmm. care of their parents spending that time with their parents working from other sides of the country mm-hmm. uh, wow why would you not do that if if you had the if ability you, you know so it's it's just been it's been life-changing and, and to be honest um i don't think it's if anything it's increased productivity again yeah I think it's decreased productivity and that's that's the that's the question that obviously comes up, right? People go, can you be as productive? And I think in, in our business, maybe more than some others, this, there's the question of collaboration, right? Um, and I get it, you know, the way we always collaborated was, you know, you'd go sit in a room or maybe you'd even, the two, a writer and art director would go downstairs to the coffee shop and, and, and concept. How are you finding that side of things working in this, this more distributed world? Yeah, I mean, I think other people have done a really good job writing about kind of the uh, the myth of the of the brainstorm <laughs> meeting, right? Yeah. Like, 
you know, again, growing up in this business as a copywriter, I think I never, ever wanted to be put in a room with another person. If that was my art director partner or mm -hmm. people with a blank sheet of paper and mm -hmm. nobody had any thoughts or ideas, right? And, you know, starting from a dead stop, right? Mm -hmm. like, go. Yeah. You know, everybody was like, it's kind of hard to think of something with all these people waiting for me to, to have right. a, a great idea. Right. So to me, yeah. there's always been that myth of mm -hmm. more ideas and better ideas. If you get a lot of people, right. The collisions you know, that happen, that they always yeah. talk about that. Right. Yeah. I think the most uh, effective, again, from my experience, the most ex uh, effective collaboration has been where, Hey, give me a little time. I'll come up with some ideas. You take some time, you come mm -hmm. up with some ideas. Right. And then we can kind of start that process mm -hmm. from kind of a running start, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a, a kind of a, a, a dead stop. And I think the tools that we have facilitate that. Work. Right. Yeah. So, you know, being able to jump on Zoom mm -hmm. and kind of say, like, all right, what do you got? All right, mm -hmm. what do you got? And yeah. just, start having those conversations i don't think it's it's detracted from from any of our ability to do that and by the way you know we still as i said we ha we have an office, have an office. yeah uh, some people sh show up there on yeah. some days but it's entirely up to them there is no mm -hmm. you have to be here on monday or friday or mm -hmm. two days a week or, or <laughs> high day. Um, we have people who come once a year you know mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there are people who do like to to show up there and, and work together in that space. And mm -hmm. uh, I found that there have been occasions where it is more effective, where we just say like, all right, we're at a point in this process where I think it'd be good for us to, to all get in a room and mm -hmm. get some stuff out on the table and, and start kind of working in mm -hmm. a, a physical yeah. uh, capacity. But um, yeah, it's, it's worked far better than, than I ever would have imagined and you know we have no intentions of of ever changing that and i do think that's been one of the most unfortunate things for people who were told somewhere in the process that they're working at a company that's going to be remote and so they made mm -hmm. decisions about mm -hmm. child care or lifestyle or yeah where they're going to live or selling mm -hmm. their car or buying a car or mm -hmm. and, and then being told like well yeah just kidding <laughs> We changed our mind. Yeah. On that, you know, it's, that's, uh, it's just not a, there has to be, you know, you talk about trust, right. And I've mm -hmm. written about trust and that is what culture is. It comes down to trust, but yep. that trust. Yes. Obviously hugely important that uh, you demonstrate your trust in the people that you hire, but you have to give them the confidence to trust you. Mm -hmm. right? when you do that kind of stuff when you say yeah we're going to be remote like sure yeah. move an hour out of the city or you know sell mm -hmm. or whatever and then you say just kidding yeah you know, like, how do you how do you trust anything that i know the lawyer tells you again i i feel like and this is something i think i've you know these these issues did not simply arise they were magnified during the pandemic yeah. but i think again there is a Advertising has a short memory, and I think they, they, they tend to believe, the industry as a whole, we tend to believe that everybody has a short memory. And so the, a lot of actions that are taken, they're, they're taken in haste. And whether it's like that, hey, go remote, and then a year later, yeah, you know, I'm just kidding, take it back, whatever, they'll get over it. Um, the same way we sort of chase and follow trends, and then it's like, oh, I wasn't really into that trend anyway. Like, all of that, you know, it, 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 it it's just such a, a short term way of thinking. And I, and I think, you know, in addition to trust, which I think is huge. And I think, you know, even something as simple as giving people the chance to decide how they want to collaborate, whether that's through zoom, they want to show up at the office, they go meet each other at a bar somewhere that they both like, whatever that's trust. But, but beyond trust, there is this layer of, of not thinking in terms of like, the, the the quarter by quarter way of looking at things and, and and we wipe the slate clean i mean you've got 10 10 year plus employees and, and 10 year plus client engagements i think that that changes a lot of the dynamic as well when when you've got a longer term view of the world um, and you 
I think what it does is it honors the fact that employees, we, you remember everything as an employee, you know, I don't care if it was seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years ago, yep. it's in there. And that's, that's sort of the cultural math, right? I'm in a place and there's a lot of stuff on the, this side of the ledger, but if you keep putting stuff on this side of the ledger, especially some big ones, like you made a mistake buying a home two hours outside of the city, like, of course people are going to leave. Yeah, of course. And, um, I don't pretend to have all the answers, but again, I come back to just thinking the approach that, that you guys are taking. And I think there's some others out there too. I think, you know, and, and you use that word experiment. And I like that word because it's not, it's not that you have to simply say, I'm going to do this thing tomorrow. And then that's how it will always be. It's more like we're going to try some things through the lens of some clear values some clear purpose, you know, and for you guys, that was being the best place to work. Right. And then that informs every decision and every experiment you take. And some of them probably go better than others. And that's okay. I mean, how do you feel like people that, that work with you on your team, they, they get that, they feel that sense that you guys are always trying things through that lens. Is that, is that clear to people? Yeah, I think so. I, I think what we've always tried to do is figure out, how do we go a, a step further? Mm. And I, I hope that that always comes through. And I think our team recognizes that. And I think it's one of the things that they appreciate. You know, I'll give you a couple examples of that. So when, you know, in, in, in the last couple of years, um, DEI initiatives obviously have become mm -hmm at a lot of agencies, right? And I think the simple steps that everybody took were, we're going to add uh, MLK Day to our holiday calendar. Right. We're going to add Juneteenth to our holiday cal calendar. Mm -hmm. We'll start a DEI task force and, and we'll, we'll create some initiatives. You know, we mm -hmm. created something we call our 50-40 pledge, um, which kind of sets, sets uh, benchmarks for representation both within our agency and um, the people that we work with. And, and we, we track all of that and we report that publicly. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all, that's all fine. Yeah. But as we thought about it, we said, how do you go a step further? How do you do something that isn't just, you know, for maybe want of a different phrase, um, virtue signaling? Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, that's, that's real. That's tangible. That, that mm -hmm. hasn't, hasn't happened. So we came up with this idea that uh, we call the equal justice experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that does is um, there's this incredible place in Montgomery, Alabama called the uh, legacy museum and memorial. Mm -hmm. uh, and we pay for each of our employees and any plus one, that they want to take. That could be a child, that could be a friend, that could be a parent, a significant other, it could be a neighbor. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. We'll pay for them too. Wow. And we pay all the expenses, flights, hotels, admission, meals, everything for you to go and spend a couple of days at the Legacy mm -hmm. Museum Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. Wow. And it's been a life-changing experience mm -hmm. for our employees. So, you know, we didn't just stop and say like, all right, have we done enough to mm -hmm. make a post and and kind of satisfy you know prospective clients that we're we're taking action yeah but we want to go a step further and and do something that actually has an impact um you know another thing that we did um when there was the overturning of roe v wade mm -hmm. uh, is we created as as i think a lot of other companies did some uh unique benefits for employees um who needed uh any type of care uh, mm -hmm. related, uh abortions yeah uh, what we did was we actually extended all of those benefits to the siblings of our employees as well oh. as the children mm. siblings so this isn't a benefit provided by our health care provided mm -hmm. money that's coming out of yeah our pockets um, but you know, we're an agency in Southern California. I mean, it's not a particularly big issue. Yeah. Uh, and when you're in a very liberal mm -hmm. state, right? 
Um, but we do have employees in six other states. We have, because right, right. uh, we're a work from anywhere agency, we have mm-hmm. employees in states where that's problematic. But yeah. more than that, we have employees Family. who have a lot of siblings and mm-hmm. children have siblings yeah. who live all over the country. Mm. So we said the benefit that we're providing to you is also applied to all of mm. those. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, to answer your question, like, I think there's a pervasive sense within our organization that High, Wide and Handsome and, and the agency's founders are not ever just going to do the minimum mm-hmm. or do things that other people have done, but they're always going to find a way to go further and come up with mm-hmm. more unique benefits that uh, serve the interests of yeah. the employees. Yeah, I mean, that's what seems to come through really powerfully in both of those is that there is that real human impact that that you're trying to achieve. It's 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 not simply checking a box. It's like, how can we provide the most impact or value or whatever the right word is to to everyone and in some cases beyond those when it goes to the family? And I think that seems to come back to that that more human centered employee centered kind of a culture. And I have to imagine that all of that just continues to like keep that trust level high because there is the, there is the sort of foundational trust of like, don't screw me over trust, which, you know, you talk about your experience when you were like 36 and you were sort of scarred from feeling that. And I think a lot of people have felt that. And so there's that base level of like, you know, Pavlovian kind of just meet my basic needs and like, and and then there's the like aspirational needs that we all have. And it, it's, you know, I want to do good in the world. I want to support my friends and my family. I want to do this and to be able to, to start touching some of those spaces for people, you know, I mean, I think that's where it becomes more transformative, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm doing this whole de work thing now, and I think like the desuckification can start at the like get rid of the the abuse, you know that's great because there's a lot of that and it's needed. But but it doesn't it shouldn't stop there, right? It it, no. it should be this constant like what else can we do? How can we push this? I want know? I I want more than anything. And sure, there's there's some selfishness involved in this. I can't mm-hmm. deny that. But I want yeah. more than anything for the people who work at High Water Handsome to be out to dinner with friends or sitting around with family at the holidays and hearing, you know, their friends or loved ones talking about how much they hate their job or how miserable they are, or some terrible thing that happened to them at work. And, and Mm -hmm. for them to say like, I love my job and I'm really proud of the place that I work and, and, you know, to talk about things like um, when they go on the equal justice experienced you know mm-hmm. all a friend like oh i'm going to be out of town for a couple of days where are you going yeah. going on the equal justice experience what is that mm-hmm. my, my, my company pays for me to and, and i'm taking my daughter mm-hmm. and, and they're they're sending me to to the legacy museum and memorial and we're going to have mm-hmm. this experience together and uh like for me you know i mean we do reviews our review process is basically inviting each employee either over to my house or over to my partner Magnus's house. Mm-hmm. And we make them some coffee. We bake some treats. We sit in the backyard and we just talk for a few hours every mm-hmm. year nice. in at our houses. And, mm-hmm. and it's, a, it's just a very personal conversation. Mm-hmm. There's no systems. There's no right. good idea in this and a seven in this and a, yeah. it's just a conversation of course we have notes and things to talk about and of course specific things but um you know we did a, a review with somebody uh, a few months ago and you know she said she's like sometimes i feel bad when i talk to my friends about my job because i love it so much and i have to <laughs> kind of stop myself from making mm. other people feel bad uh, oh, about wow. it you know and i'm like it's that's what we want to hear. We want to hear that sense of, of pride mm-hmm. uh, that, that goes beyond, like you said, it's not just my, my job doesn't suck. 
Right. Like, like, they don't do all the terrible things to me that yeah. everybody else has to suffer through. Yeah. But it's actually a source of of pride. Yeah. And and you know, you know, I should I should say, to be honest, um, I while yes, I always love when our employees feel like they have the best job and work at the best company of any place they know. Mm-hmm. It is an ambition for me. Honestly, the reason I, I, you know, agreed to come on here and, and, and do this is um, it's nice to, to provide that for 30 people. Yeah. But like, I'd like to see it for, for a lot more. So I'm probably lying when I say like, you know, I love when I hear like yeah. you know, my friends hate their job, but like, I get to tell them how much I love my job. Right. Like, you know, honestly, part of me is like, well, yeah. how do we fix your friend's job? Yeah. Right. Well, that's that, that creative problem solving thing that we can't shut off shows up. Right. Yeah. And and that's why I want to spread the gospel as much as possible. Right. It's why I write about these things. Like Mm -hmm. when we came up with peer pay, I wrote an article on LinkedIn called, Mm -hmm. uh, this is the, the best employee benefit we've ever come up with. Please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I love that. I laid it out. This is how it works. And mm-hmm. I actually put my my phone number and my email in there. And I said, um, if you'd like to start peer pay at your company, give me a call. Send me an email. Listen, and I actually got, um, I won't name them, but um, I got a few emails and, and well, phone cool. calls from some, some very big agencies um, who yeah. said, you know, we read this and we're interested in doing it. We'd love to understand how it works. So we could apply it here. Right. And so for me, it's not about how do we keep this yeah secretive and and how do we kind of just create this incredible little island for these 30 people mm-hmm. but, but you know, how do we help influence because again if it's the experiment and we're the guinea pigs then i want people to kind of look at us and say yeah. okay you took the risk you showed it works now we'll yeah. take that i'm gonna grab that yeah i mean that's that's the beauty of experiments and it it kind of leads into one of the the final questions i like to ask and i, I feel like the answer is already forming here but you know, if you could wave a magic wand, what would a, a fully desuckified work world look like? You know, I mean, what, what does that look yeah, like? Yeah, I mean, I wish I, I wish I had that magic wand. Um, I, I think, you know, I guess I would answer that with something I've, I've said a lot and written about, um, which is, I think most companies create their policies for the 2% of people that can't be trusted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that has such a negative effect on the 98% of people who can. Yeah. But it's such a strange dynamic. Like everywhere mm-hmm. I've ever worked prior to High Wide and Handsome, there was always, you know, again, we look at peer pay. Mm-hmm. Everyone who hears about that says, but isn't somebody going to game the system? Like, yeah. isn't somebody going to say, I'll give you $500 if mm-hmm. you give me? hundred dollars you know right. it's distinct is to say like that could happen somebody might do that so let's deprive mm-hmm. all the others yeah person, mm-hmm. right which is such a backwards way of thinking and i do think if there were one thing that every company in the world could do to completely fundamentally change that dynamic and turn themselves into a significantly better place to work and engender mm-hmm. significantly more loyalty from the most valuable employees. It would just be to say, we're going to set our policies for the 98% of people who can be trusted. Mm-hmm. And we'll, we'll deal with the 2% right. who end up mis, misusing yeah. whatever benefit yeah. we provide. But most companies say, we're going to make the, the policies for the 2% who can't, and that's at the expense of the 90%, 8% of people. And and why would you do that at the expense of the people who are the most trustworthy? The most trustworthy and often the most valuable, like you said. And yeah, I feel that I've never thought of it that way, but that just immediately like hits me because I I imagine people who listen to this will be nodding their heads like, yeah, why is it that way? So I I love that. Um, So the last question I ask everybody is a little sillier. I, I've, I'm big on sound effects with this show. If you listen to the intro or the outro, you hear cat meows and people yelling and all that stuff. And um, I, my, I lean towards goofy sound effects. I make fart noises and all this kind of stupid stuff because I'm, I'm a 10-year-old at heart. Um, 
I'd love to get something from you. Is there any kind of sound you do? You make it to your dog, whatever it is like that, that we can add to our library of uh, desuckified sound effects. Um, yeah, I can probably give you something, uh, okay. you know, and I think it kind of relates back to the conversation we've been having, um, mm -hmm. as, as we've talked about one of the huge benefits to me from, uh, about working from anywhere has been the ability to spend so much more time with my dogs and, and mm -hmm. we didn't use my dog Lincoln, but I do have another little dog named Tina. Um, mm -hmm. we got Tina, uh, at a senior adoption day about five or six years ago when she was 10, um, She's the most incredible little Shih Tzu mix. She has eight teeth uh, and these little um, bow legs in the back that mm -hmm. uh, kind of make her walk like a little cowgirl. Yeah. Uh, the, the biggest dewy eyes. And, and you know, honestly, my, my wife laughs at me all the time um, because anytime I walk into a room with her, I just look at her and I make the same sound every time. And, and what's amazing about it is, again, going back to what we've talked about today, these are things that if I were in an office, I wouldn't mm -hmm. think it up, right? But like I yeah. could be on, on a call and maybe have a bad call and I walk out of my office here in the house and then I walk into the other room and, and there's Tina. Yeah. And the, the change just happens instantly, mm -hmm. right? Like I walk out and I'm just like, oh man, that was a tough call. Yay! <laughs> That's it. Like I just see her and... And that's what happens. Like she just brings that joy out of me. Right. So like, no matter what, what's happening in my life, you know, it could be like, oh man, I got to get on a flight. And I, Yay. And, <laughs> and it's, just, that. It's, just, it's like visceral. It's involuntary. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's just, this little dog with, with these, with these dewy eyes and this, this sense of joy. And uh, it just kind of elicits that response from me. I love that. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, like I said, it's uh, it's it is part of to use your word the desuccification process. Yeah. Um, when when you can have the the benefit of of those things that bring joy into your life in a way that just weren't conceivable. Mm -hmm. you're, you're even in the 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 dog friendly right. environments. Yeah. Uh, it's not the it's same. Still, it's still a different dynamic, right? Yeah. So, so, yeah. That 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 instant ability to connect to those things that really matter to us um, yeah. is, is, is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Well, Mike, I, I really appreciate you coming on today. I think I, I'm with you. I'm here to help support you in preaching that gospel. I think you guys are doing a lot of wonderful things that, that, that are absolutely the kinds of things that come to mind when I started this idea of, of desuckify work. It's just, um, I think we need more of it. We need more people doing the experimentation thing. Um, you know, before we go, I just want to give people a chance. If anybody wants to follow you, um, what's the easiest way to, to keep track of what you or your company is up to? Yeah. I mean, we're on uh, Instagram at, uh, we are HWH. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you can hit up our website, uh, highwidehandsome.com. There's no, mm -hmm. okay. In there. Um, and you can find us on LinkedIn as well. And, uh, you know, hopefully um, we're in the process right now of trying to defend our number one ranking on Ad Age's uh, best places to work in America list. So we were awesome. proud to rank number one last year on that list. And uh, the survey just went out this this week to all of our employees. So, you know, hopefully uh, people will see us on that list again in, in uh, 2024. Awesome. Well, I'm rooting for you, Mike. Well, uh yeah, well, keep doing what you're doing, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks, TJ. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone, for checking out the Desuckify Work podcast. And thanks to Mike for being a thoughtful and thought-provoking guest. You can follow Mike and High, Wide, and Handsome on LinkedIn, and check out their site at highwidehandsome.com. Here's hoping more than a few agencies feel inspired to follow their employee-first lead. Bye, everyone. 